So we are going to start with the glaucoma. And um, glaucoma is a very interesting subject because it is also called the silent thief of sight. We shall see as the lecture goes on why we call it the silent thief, but uh, it's because basically it has no symptoms and it's painless. So people don't realize until it is too late. So we start off with the, um, how many people are blind and then we see how many are blind due to glaucoma. And then what we think um, is the glaucoma burden in Uganda. So globally, uh, the number of people are blind and uh, it's about 400 million people who are blind for several reasons. And half of that is because of uh, a condition called cataract. I don't know if you've covered it, but cataract is the leading cause of blindness worldwide. And this is followed by um, glaucoma in some areas. In some areas, it's followed by uncorrected ref refractive errors. When you look at the prevalence of glaucoma, for example, in Uganda, you find that uh, about about one percent of the population. So if Uganda is about 45 million people, then four and a half million are blind. And of that, a half of that, that is two, about two and a half million is because of cataracts. But then the next proportion, about 0.4 percent, is because of um, um, glaucoma. So it's quite a common condition. And uh, if we look at the, um, what we call the backlog, we have people who are already blind because of glaucoma. And we have people who have glaucoma and they are not blind. Now, the population prevalence of glaucoma in East Africa is about 4%. 4% as the case of Uganda, Uganda has the second highest prevalence of glaucoma in Africa, which follows uh, Nigeria, which is about 6%. So it is quite a common problem. If you think about HIV being about 6% or diabetes being about 3%, then you realize that glaucoma is such a big uh, burden. And so an important topic to think about. So what makes glaucoma different in Africa is because one, I talked about the high prevalence, which we have, but secondly is because the disease is generally asymptomatic. And because of that, we need a very good screening detection mechanism. Without that, then we cannot be able to detect this disease early and so people end up coming uh, late. We recently have uh, um, won a grant as a department, uh, which is going to be funded by an organization called CBM. And what we want to do is to take uh, glaucoma screening to the primary health centers, that's starting from health center four, so that when people walk in, they can get, among other things, a screening service for uh, glaucoma. The other problem is that uh, we don't have enough treatment options for glaucoma. So treatment, especially for Africa, tends to be very limited. All over the world, um, innovations in the last decade have uh, availed so many treatment options for glaucoma which include medicines and uh, surgical options and, and laser treatments. But those are not very common um, in many centers in Africa. The cost of care is high. Uh, glaucoma is a chronic disease, just like diabetes, hypertension, HIV, which means that when someone is on treatment, for example, eye drops, they need to use them every day for the rest of their life. 
and that has a cost implication which many people might not afford. Again, the care of glaucoma has been largely centralized. In Uganda, for example, glaucoma treatment is found only in tertiary institutions like ours and Molago, which makes it difficult for people um, where our population is predominantly rural to access this care. Lastly, but not least, we have a problem of negative social marketing. This is because when someone comes to the hospital and they have glaucoma, even with the best care they get, it's not that their vision will improve. The purpose of treating glaucoma is not to improve vision because once the optic nerve is damaged, then there is little that can be done. So the purpose is to maintain and preserve whatever vision is left, which means that when this person goes back to the community, they will tell their colleagues that, well, I was treated, it was expensive, and I have not seen any change. That discourages the other people from coming to take up service. As I mentioned, the general prevalence in Africa is about 4%. And, I, and um, it, it, it goes um, higher in West Africa to about six to eight percent in areas like in Nigeria. The global average prevalence is about two percent. So you see that Africa really takes the lion's share. And if you have to compute that into terms of absolute numbers, uh, it gives you about eight million people having glaucoma in Africa. And as I mentioned, many of them come with advanced disease, which tends to be very aggressive. So the picture you can see to the right is uh, one, a picture of the optic nerve, and secondly, a picture of a visual field, which I will talk about um, in the next few slides. Again, this is uh, just to reiterate the numbers that uh, I talked about in terms of people who have eye problems. But you can see that globally, about 76 million people uh, have glaucoma, which is quite a big number. Just to touch on a bit, this, these slides are from the WHO World Report on Vision. Uh, which was published in 2019. And recently, uh, we also published with colleagues, international colleagues, the Lancet Global Commission report on global eye health. And what the point is that um, it is important to realize that eye conditions include also not just blinding conditions, but there are other important conditions which can make people seek care, such as um, these conditions that you can see on a slide. So let's look at the pathology. And um, this is just a, a schematic of um, sagittal section of the, car, the brain, the head. And you can see the eyeball there. And you have the optic nerve, which goes, travels all the way to the back of the eye, the optic cortex. And this is where the damage happens in the red um, area. That's where the glaucoma damage happens. When you look at the eye that has, uh, this is a normal eye. Uh, many of you will have an opportunity to do this when you start your ophthalmology rotations. So this is the normal eye. Uh, this is the optic disc, which comes as it's the head of the optic nerve. And out of the optic disc in the center, you get blood vessels which come to supply the brain, the, the, the retina. Now, at the point of exit of these blood vessels, there is like a tunnel. This is called a cup. And between this and the edge of the optic, the disc area, this is neural tissue. These are millions and millions of axons of, um, which form up the optic nerve. So this is a normal optic disc. 
Therefore, when you look at um, an optic disc which has glaucoma, so this one is a normal one. And then as glaucoma starts to set in, then there is degeneration and death of this tissue. And so this cup keeps on widening and widening and eventually it is completely obliterated and you have just the remaining disc area. So if you so there's something we call cup disc ratio. So this is the cup and this is the disc. So the cup disc ratio is usually not more than 0 0.5. So this is 0 0.5, which is normal. This is about 0 0.7-ish, which is already a problem. This is about 0 0.8. Uh, you can see this border is really, really extending towards the rim. And this one is a cup disc ratio of one because the cup is the same size like the disc. Therefore, if you're to define this condition, uh, maybe this one, you might need to write it down. It is basically an optic neuropathy. And this optic neuropathy is characterized by disc changes and corresponding visual field loss. And this can be with or without raised intraocular pressure. Although we know that the biggest mechanism of this condition is that the pressure of the eye, when it rises, it can lead to this uh, problem. But it is not uncommon that we see some people where the pressure is fairly normal and they get this condition. Now, I talked about um, the problem of being uh, asymptomatic. Now, this is a, 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 an illustration we presented with colleagues. And this is a man who is looking at this house. And this is his right eye. And you can clearly see that in the right eye, there is already damage to this extent. And if he looks with the right eye only, he will not be able to see this part of the, the household. And then this is his left eye. Now, the left eye, on the other hand, has this scotoma. The right has this scotoma, the left has this scotoma, meaning that when both eyes are open, he will not realize any scotomas because what he is missing in the right eye is being compensated by the left eye. And what is missing in the left eye is being compensated by the right eye. So when both eyes are open, the man is seeing very, very well, or the woman. Um, and so this person might never realize they have a problem unless they are screened or when things worsen. Because they are bound to worsen over time, the blindness keeps on coming in and eventually it closes off. So the criteria like I've mentioned is uh, for the criteria for diagnosis is um, the optic nerve damage, the visual field loss, the raised intraocular pressure is a bonus. So when we examine the optic nerve, basically what we are looking for is evidence of damage. As you can see from A up to D, you can see there is progressive uh, damage, which is um, pathognomonic for glaucoma. How do we examine, apart from the optic disc assessment, we look at a structure called a trabecular meshwork. I don't know if you covered the anatomy series, but uh, there, is a, there, there is between the cornea and the sclera and then the iris in that border, there is a, I call it a drainage sink. And the drainage sink is where the aqueous humor after it has circulated the anterior chamber will eventually drain 
back into the into the eye into the sclera and then goes back into the bloodstream. Now in there, there are structures. A key structure is called the trabecular meshwork. This one where you see TM, it is pigmented like that. And so we are able to visualize it using a special uh, lens called a gonioscopy lens. And the reason we want to view this, uh, this, uh, this angle is because we want to determine the type of the glaucoma. Glaucoma has two types. It can either be closed angle or open angle. So when you look with a gonio lens and you're able to see the trabecular meshwork, this means that this angle is open. And when you look with a gonio lens and you cannot see the trabecular meshwork, it means that the angle is closed. And so you make a conclusion of open or closed angle. Therefore, you cannot make that diagnosis of open or closed unless you visualize the trabecular measure. We also measure intraocular pressure and we have different methods uh, that we use. Uh, this one is called the Goldman Applanation Tonometer. It is the gold standard. It's the most reliable method of measuring intraocular pressure. But it, it has limitations because it is mounted on a slit lamp and the patient must be able to cooperate and um, it must be done in a hospital setting. We have this Shields. Shields tonometer is one of the oldest tonometers available. Uh, Shields as in S-H-I-O-T-Z, <coughs> excuse me. S-H-I-O-T-Z, <coughs> Shields tonometer. And uh, it's, as you can see, it's very portable, it's very, affordable and we can use this in the primary setting. Then we have uh, the Parkins tonometer, which works like a Goldman tonometer. It is also an applanation type. It is portable and you can use it in the outreach setting. Recently, we have a new kid on the block. Uh, it's called the eye care tonometer. And it's very, very useful because it has this small white probe. So the small white probe jumps out of the eye care, like how a chameleon throws its tongue and bounces off the cornea and you're able to get reliable measurements in a very, very short time. And um, it's very um, comfortable even for children and even for patients who are not that cooperative. So it is what we are more and more using and you can use it in an outreach um, setup. We are one of our residents now doing a, a study to compare uh, the reliability of these versus the Goldman in our population. The other thing we do is the visual field test, uh, which I talked about. So this to the left is the normal visual field. And um, each visual field has a, a blind spot, this one here. This is the place that um, where the optic nerve is located on the retina. So this place does not have any retina tissue. And so it will not detect any light. It's called a blind spot. And this is, um, this is normal. Now this eye, <clears throat> on the other hand, this eye is, um, has the blind spot, which you can see here. Uh, everyone has a blind spot. It's the one that falls in love because love is blind. So it has a blind spot here. And then this damage that you can see is because of um, glaucoma, this one. So when we see this, it is clear that this person has um, glaucoma. So the visual field um, machine looks like that. The person looks in their head and then they can focus on the on different lights which are being projected. Excuse me, let me just charge my phone. I mean my laptop. Just a minute.
Okay. Moving on. We also have what we call the optic coherence tomography. It is a CT scan, like you can have a brain CT scan. This one is a scan of the eye. It can scan the optic nerve and the retina. The beauty about this is that we are able to see any early changes on the retina and in the optic nerve in fine detail. And we can be able to see if there is progression going on. So it's, uh, there are several machines, but one of them looks like this. And you can scan uh, the optic nerve and the retina. So it produces a, a result sheet like this. Uh, it, so many parameters that we check. But the main point is that um, the, the machine then produces a result which is um, adjusted for age and gender and race in some machines. And you can see on the, on the right is um, the, the right eye and the left eye. And then it shows you the thickness, the symmetry, the rim area, disc area, cup disc ratio and volume. And it produces color codes. So color codes um, are based on um, the normal population ranges. So when a color code is green, it shows that um, this is normal. When a color code is yellow, it shows that uh, there is a borderline problem. And if the color code is red, like in this eye, you see, then it shows you that um, clearly there is damage. So the, the film, the, the sheet on the right is for a normal person, everything is normal. And the one on the left shows that the left eye of this person is okay, but the right eye has a problem. So glaucoma tends to be asymmetrical, the way it attacks. Uh, it can attack one eye more severe than the other but it's just a matter of time before the other one also gets affected. So after we've done uh, an assessment, then how do we treat this condition? This condition, the treatment has three options at the moment. We have medicine, we can do surgery, or we can use laser. The purpose of the medicine is to basically reduce uh, intraocular pressure. Unfortunately, until today, our knowledge and technology is only able to modify that variable alone. And the hypothesis is that if we can reduce the intraocular pressure, then that would be enough to prevent further damage. Now, there are several ways of doing that. You can reduce the intraocular pressure by reducing aqueous humor production or increasing aqueous humor drainage. If you think about IOP being controlled because it's a certain finite volume of aqueous within this tight chamber, if you cut off the tap, then you reduce the amount in this chamber and subsequently you reduce the pressure. If you increase the amount of the volume that is leaving, again, you achieve the same thing. So there are drugs which work on this stage. We have the beta receptor antagonists. The commonest one is called Timolol. Then we also have carbonic anhydrase inhibitors the commonest one is called acetazolamide. Then um, we have alpha receptor agonists like brimonidine. Then we have drugs which increase outflow, such as pro prostaglandins. And uh, we have several available, but the commonest being latanoprost. The next slide uh, has the list of these uh, um, drugs, um, which you can um, look at. And then um, 
really don't have to memorize this, but just understanding that some drugs like Timolol are beta blockers, some drugs like agon, like Rimonidine are alpha agonists, and some drugs like um, acetazolamide are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. These reduce production. And these increase outflow, the prostaglandins I talked about, like latanoprost, uh, the non-selective alpha agonists like epinephrine and cholinometric drugs like pilocarpine. So these ones are not commonly used um, because of the severe side effect profile, but also they are quite ancient. So the common drugs we use are the beta blockers, alpha agonists, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and prostaglandin analogs. Those are the commonest drugs that we use. And like I mentioned before, when we use them, then they are um, for life, just like hypertension and just like uh, diabetes. Glaucoma surgery, there are several options and the names are here on the list. Tabeculectomy is the commonest one that we do at the department, and, uh, but we also have other options. Uh, there is a YouTube video link which you can watch at your free time uh, to see how a trabeculectomy is done. And um, when you get an opportunity, God willing, and you're in our department, you can also watch some of these cases live. So this is an eye which has undergone a trabeculectomy, and the tra trabeculectomy basically means you create a, an artificial stoma through the trabecular meshwork, and then you, you direct the aqueous. It drains now from the anterior chamber into the sclera area. So this is under the conjunctiva. You see this conjunctiva is ballooned because the aqueous is now draining through the trabecular meshwork directly into the conjunctiva space. It tends to work very well. And we've done, uh, so far published two papers on trabeculectomy, one where we looked at long-term outcomes of trabeculectomy in our population, we found it did well. And we also published another one where we looked at the stability of trabeculectomy versus other treatment options. And we found that it did uh, very well. So it's an option uh, that is uh, useful. Recently, there's a paper which uh, was published uh, from uh, the UK, also showing that even in uh, advanced uh, economic countries, people who generally have severe glaucoma do well with trabeculectomy versus any other surgical option. Now, this is um, a, a treatment called a selective laser trabeculoplasty, SLT. So it's a laser option. And what it does is that um, in the trabecular meshwork, you can treat the trabecular meshwork with laser. And if you do that, you will increase the space in between the sieve, the trabecular meshwork sieve. If you think about the trabecular meshwork like a sieve, so if you treat it with laser, you can increase the pores in the sieve and allow more aqueous drainage. It is an outpatient procedure. Uh, if you remember the trabecular meshwork that I showed you in the earlier um, picture, uh, this is the trabecular meshwork. And what we do, uh, watch carefully, is that we treat it with laser. And those laser, I'll, I'll just show it again. Those laser um, spots, they go around, around the trabecular meshwork several times and uh, they create an increase in the pores so that you can have more drainage. There is the light study, uh, which was a landmark study, again done in the UK, but so many collaborating centers globally. And what this slide study showed was that um, the selective laser trabeculoplasty did as well as the first line medication. 
The first line medication is a prostaglandin analog, which is latanoprost. And in comparison with latanoprost, selective laser trabeculoplasty did as well as latanoprost. What that means in terms of clinical application is that treatment naive glaucoma patients would be most um, would benefit most from this technique because you treat the, the eye with laser and you do it once. So you do it once and you might need to repeat it after a year or two, but that means that you, you relieve the patient of the eye drop burden of having to put an eye drop every day. This time they just have laser and come back after a year or so. So I'll stop here uh, for the glaucoma lecture, unless there are, let me see if there are questions. And then, um, let me just see in the chat. So wild hepatitis day, okay, thank you. Um, the, the, the reference ranges, okay, yeah. I thank you, Dra Dramadri, you answered that, that is correct. Don't expect have an effect on the accuracy of results. And I don't know which results you mean, but um, yes, if someone, um, <clears throat> if when we go to do the visual field, for example, then we must do it with the best corrected vision of that person. So if a person wears spectacles, they need to wear their spectacles as they do the visual field. When we are measuring the pressure of the eye, we don't need uh, visual fields. We just, um, I mean, we don't need spectacles. We just put it on the cornea and measure. Glaucoma definition, I think I've given it, but it is basically optic neuropathy that is characterized by disc changes and visual field defects. It might be with or without raised pressure. So raised pressure is not an important, um, yes, thank you, Derek, that was, that's correct, precisely. All right. Um, I have a question for Doctor. Do you have laser eye? Yes, we have. Uh, we have it. Uh, I mean, the picture I showed is my picture doing the laser. So we do have it. What does, what preventive measures exist for glaucoma? Screening, screening, because there's really no preventive measure. I didn't talk about the risk factors, but basically family history is an important one. So if uh, a first degree relative had glaucoma, then chances are high that um, the relatives will have. So when we see a person with glaucoma, one of the things we tell them is to invite all his first degree relatives who are above 35 years to have their eyes screened. That's important. There are other conditions which predispose to glaucoma, such as uh, people who are generally short-sighted, or myopia. Myopia predisposes to glaucoma to an extent. There are conditions uh, where people use eye drops, like steroid eye drops, people who have allergy, or people who have other conditions like uveitis. They can, um, if they use steroids for a long time, they can develop raised intraocular pressure, which predisposes them to glaucoma. Uh, we have conditions like diabetes, which uh, has been associated with uh, glaucoma and uh, systemic things um, which increase venous resistance. If you think about aqueous leaving the eyeball, it depends on the venous pressure gradient. So when the venous resistance is high, then less aqueous will leave the eyeball. And so that can predispose to glaucoma. Prevention is by screening, and that's, that's the rationale of the project I talked about. What's the maximum number of trabeculoplasty? Thank you very much. So the laser treatment has also been undergoing modifications. 
the first technology that we had was called ALT, argon laser trabeculoplasty. Argon laser trabeculoplasty was done once because it was associated with actual physical changes in the trabecular meshwork. Selective laser trabeculoplasty, on the other hand, does not have any physical changes. It works on the, on, the, on the melanin in the trabecular meshwork. So all you need to do is to expose the trabecular meshwork to the laser. And that laser, the, the melanin in there will absorb the laser and then it starts to work. So it's a very simple and uh, not so skill intensive uh, technique, but it doesn't cause any change on the uh, trabecular meshwork. So you can do it for life. Um, uh, one of the, the best evidence papers we are following is uh, a paper from Hong Kong, which showed that um, if you treat people with SLT once a year, that's enough to keep their pressure controlled. So uh, you can do it as many times as you want. The initial thinking was you do it once and when it does not work, you do it another time. And if it does not work, you change to another option. But the practice has been informed by evidence otherwise. So these surgical interventions all apply to close angle glaucoma. That's a brilliant question, Simon. Um, no. So the, the laser itself works on the principle that you can visualize the, the angle. So the angle must be open because you're treating the trabecular meshwork, which you should be able to see when you're doing the laser. The surgical options like trabeculotomy, trabecular, trabeculectomy, all those, they work because those work from outside the eye. But the in-the-eye procedures like um, uh, trabecular, I mean, uh, trabeculoplasties, they will not work for closed angles. You need to see the angle. So if there is no raised IOP, do we still use the first line drugs? Thank you, Miro. That's a brilliant question. Yes, we do. I used not to actually, because, um, because what is the rationale? How much pressure can you reduce <clears throat> Excuse me. How much pressure can you reduce if someone comes and their IOP is twelve, and they they have um, glucomatous changes? How much IOP should you reduce to? But again, informed by <clears throat> excuse me, informed by evidence, we have realized that. IOP is the only thing we can modify about glaucoma care. So yes, someone can have a pressure of 12, but in that eye, a pressure of 12 is damaging. So if we can reduce the pressure to maybe eight or seven, you find that that gives you good control. It's also the same thing that applies to people who have raised IOP, but they don't have any glucomatous uh, changes, what we call ocular hypertension. The initial, uh, the initial practice again was not to treat, but we have seen over time that these people eventually develop uh, glaucoma. So if someone has ocular hypertension, we will treat, even if they don't have optic neuropathy and visual field changes, we will treat. What causes the pathophysiology? Okay, I don't know what you mean, but um, basically the whole underlying mechanism is that you are producing more aqueous than you are draining. So that is triggered by changes in the trabecular meshwork, which increase aqueous flow resistance. And when aqueous flow resistance is there, it means that you are not draining as much aqueous as you should. And eventually the pressure of the eye increases. And the effects of that pressure are seen at the back 
which is the optic nerve. Okay, pathogenesis, I guess the same thing. Um, from Godfrey, what presenting complaint will highlight glaucoma as a differential? Wow, that's also another <laughs> tricky question. Now, <clears throat> depends. Acute angle closure glaucoma. I didn't talk about it a lot because it is not common in our setting. In one year, in a year, on average, we see about two to three cases with acute angle closure glaucoma. The presentation there is clear. The eye is painful. The eye is red. The pupil is dilated. The person reports seeing halos. They have headache and they are vomiting. So it's quite dramatic. And I imagine even if the patient presented to you, maybe in a hospital or health center for wherever you are, it is quite dramatic that you will not miss it. Open angle, on the other hand, is the, is the subtle, clandestine, you will not know. What usually brings these patients is when their vision starts to go. And most times when the vision starts to go, then when they come, you find that either one eye is advanced and then the other eye is moderate. So when they present to us, we have an opportunity of saving the better eye. And that's why even when we treat for glaucoma, we start with the eye that sees. And that confuses many people, but why are you treating the eye that is seeing and leaving the one which is, um, which is not seeing? So we start like that. Now, other people who might say they are lucky, it, it, it is routine examination. Someone comes with a red eye, maybe they have um, an infection or allergy. They just walk into the hospital, oh, my eyes are itching. You have a look at the conjunctiva, you make a diagnosis. But then you go ahead and look at the optic disc. Just like you go to the hospital for malaria and then they say, oh, you have diabetes or you have hypertension. So it's really incidental finding. And then when you look at the optic disc, you see these changes and then you do the workup. So that is why the practice therefore that we have is that everyone who is aged above 35 years old, we must look at the optic disc the first time they present to the hospital to do that baseline. Is massive population screening an effective intervention in bringing down the high prevalence of glaucoma in Uganda? That's a tricky question, Miro. And um, <clears throat> when you design screening programs, one of the things you must think about is the cost effectiveness of the program. If you had screen 100 people to catch four people with glaucoma, I don't know how effective that is at the population level. But within a health system, I think that is um, sellable. So for example, what our program is going to do is that we are going to introduce a screening checklist at health center for level, which means that a person walking into that health center for, for say malaria or a fever, but they happen to be above 35 years old, can have their screening done as part of the routine service. And hey, if they find that this person has features of glaucoma, then that person is referred to the secondary level, say a regional referral hospital like Masaka, where further tests can be done. So the purpose is to decentralize our services to the primary and secondary level. So population-based, maybe it might not be as useful as the things like COVID, which are everywhere, but within a health system, yes, um, the case is valid. Open angle and closed angle glaucoma, which one has a poorer prognosis and is harder to manage? Wow, uh, this is another brilliant question. And uh, there is no right or wrong answer. It really depends. The beauty about closed angle is that it has a very dramatic um, presentation that 
the person will not delay at home. That pain, the person will present just the next day or that very day to the hospital. Now, sometimes you find that the treatment for closed angle can resolve the issue once and for all without any damage to the optic nerve. When we make a diagnosis of, of closed angle, we don't depend on visual fields, we don't depend on the optic nerve. So if someone comes, pressure is high, they have those same features I talked about, it's closed angle glaucoma, period, whether the, the optic nerve is damaged or not. So it means that these people tend to come early. And when you take away what caused their closed angle, some people, we just, have, we just do a peripheral iridectomy. A peripheral iridectomy is you put a small hole into the peripheral iris so that now aqueous, instead of coming through the pupil, can go through that hole. And that's it for that person. Or some people come with closed angle because they have a big intraocular lens. So you remove that and replace it with an artificial lens and that's it for that person. They will never get um, that condition again. So their prognosis is good. The challenge with open angle is delayed presentation. Because as again, I mentioned, when the disease is already advanced, really it's just that you, you cannot reverse the vision loss, it just prevents um, further damage. So that's a challenge. If you see someone with open angle early, I usually congratulate them and say, well, you have this condition, it's a terrible one, but you're not at any risk of going blind because you will manage it. So that is the issue. Of course, with open angle, it is a chronic disease and people have a tendency of, you know, falling out of care. They stop putting their medicine, you know, they disappear from the hospital for years. So such things can worsen the prognosis. What is used, this is, this is Shakira Nakanike. What is used, is this the RRD? What is used to measure the cup disc ratio? Eyeball, we just eye, there's really nothing. That's why I can say, well, the cup disc ratio is 0 0.5. Another one comes and says, ah, ah this is 0 0.7. Another one comes and says, hmm, this is 0 0.6. So it really depends. Uh, but when you do that over time, you kind of, the eye kind of becomes trained, trained and becomes uh, more reliable when you look at many, many optic discs, you become more, it's just like uh, you guys, when you go to Gainward and you're assessing the what? The cervical dilatation, cervix dilatation, it's the same thing, very subjective. Uh, from Masikov Sinje, Doc, you keep emphasizing 35 years, can't one younger than that present with severe glaucoma? Yes, they can. There are other types of glaucoma such as a congenital glaucoma, which attacks babies. There are others like juvenile glaucoma, which attacks adolescents. But those are not common. It's just like type one diabetes, they are not common. So at a population public health level, we mostly address, um, you know, adult onset glaucoma. And the, uh, the prevalence data that we have shows that more people commonly above 35 um, are the ones who present uh, with glaucoma. So for public health uh, sort of screening measures, you want to be as, um, as cost effective as you can, but diseases don't read books, so you can get a 30 old have coming with glaucoma, but those are rare. Uh, from Nathan Murungi. So can I say I prefer getting close down? Well, yeah, I like Adson's answer. Well, you really none, uh, really none. Okay. Um, thank you. Those are really engaging questions. I'm, I'm excited about your questions. That is really, really good. And um, I don't know if there's someone who wants to, to shout out a question. If not, Yes, I have a question. 
Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, this is Jonathan Melonji. So my question is going to relate to one of the stories. Uh, one of our great, the great musician in East Africa, she's a Kenyan. She's called uh, Christia Asige. I think people might relate her from a song called uh, Extravaganza from Saudi Soul. So her scenario was about uh, getting, uh, okay, being confirmed with glaucoma from the UK. That was around, I think, 2010. And by that time, her opening pressures were 40 to 45, high intraocular pressures. And I think uh, the opticians at the time and uh, Oculus told her that uh, she wouldn't be able to see again. And of, as, of, as, as I say now, she cannot be able to see as of this time. Uh, so my question would be, in relation to her story, uh, does opening pressures, when they're too hard, do they also depict a poor prognosis? Then another thing is that, is there, uh, I have just two more questions. For the black eyes, uh, us being having black eyes as Africans, does it make it worse in case that we get in case we get glaucoma compared to the whites? That would be my second question. Then my third question would be if you have such opening of such high pressures, when they tell you may not be able to see again amidst uh, the, the the surgeries, is there can that person can such a situation be reversed or such in case such pressures are that high? There's nothing much you can do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, let me just show this page. Okay, um, this, this work was uh, published by our group uh, just recently. And um, what we did was comparing uh, visual field loss, severe, okay, visual field loss, uh, from a cohort of patients presenting to, um, to in Tanzania, uh, one of our collaborating centers, the Kilimanjaro Christian um, Medical College, KCMC, and data from England. Now, what you can see here, Jonathan, is that many, and black means severe visual loss, uh, red is a, this is very severe, severe, maybe moderately severe, and this is still normal. What you can see, uh, John, John, Jonathan, is that majority of the patients in Tanzania, and by extension in Africa really, present with very severe uh, visual field loss, very severe visual field loss. In our cohort here, when we published a paper, this. 60% of our population who came with glaucoma were already blind, all right? Now, opening pressure, I rather, it is, all, it is presenting vision rather than opening pressure that is a problem. Because if people, if this is over half of the people, you see the visual field does, compare this to England, where not so many people, and even these people in, in, the, in the black are people who are basically from what you can call a sort of lower social economic status, relatively, the UK. The UK has what they call a GP system and an optometry system. So a GP system is like um, when, you, when you go to any borough or when it's called, it's a village. When you go to any village in the UK, Okay, the first thing you need is to register with your general practitioner. Just like here by law, you're required to register with an LC1. And your general practitioner is supposed to conduct a baseline evaluation. And then you go there routinely. So those work closely with community optometrists. A community optometrist basically are a version of a general practitioner, but for the eye. So it, it means that in the UK, every adult is able to interface with an eye practitioner at least once a year. And when that is done, it is very easy for them to identify things when they are still early compared to our setting where 60% of the people came when they're already blind. Now, so it is the opening vision that marks the prognosis. If the vision is already poor, at presentation, there is nothing really that can be done to reverse that vision. So that marks a prognosis. 
When pressures are high, say like 45, it can happen in a case of, say, closed, uh, uh, acute closed angle glaucoma. But then once you bring the pressures down, then that person might be able to regain some vision because they, what they are presenting with is a mix of the high pressure, but also things like cornea edema because of the raised pressure. So it is more on the vision really, rather than the pressure that is the challenge. And the second question I have forgotten, sorry. Um, let me, see. you want to remind me? Yeah, uh, it was the opening pressure. Then uh, my question was, uh, she related her story that uh, the, the you look in, this, in the UK, sorry? Yes, I don't know if you can hear me. So well, I can hear you, but there's someone who has opened their mic. Okay. Uh, well, I talked about it because uh, she, she had been in Mombasa earlier on in her years. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. That is when they, they were asked, they, uh, they, that's when she was able to go to the hospital. And at that time, they told her that black people or the people who have uh, who have black eyes, the 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 outcome might be poor because I think of the black eyes. That is why I was asking the question. In ah, yeah. That. Okay. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Surgery. You're right, Jonathan. You're right. I've remembered. So yes, opening pressure, no, but opening vision or presenting vision, yes. And then, uh, generally, the data is that in predominantly black population the type of glaucoma tends to be aggressive. And so that can indicate the prognosis. And so that's why the treatment needs to be aggressive. The advantage of the black population, um, we see that a lot like when we treat with laser is that because they have a lot of melanin, then the laser tends to work very well in that population compared to the white population where their trabecular mishwak is not that melanized. All right, um, we need to move on, I think. Uh, let me see, we have more comments. I think students need to also be told how risk factors of disease are obtained. Well, and I think I mentioned them, but I can reiterate. I said family history is one of them. Use of eye drops like steroids, which can increase the intraocular pressure, conditions like diabetes, uh, hypertension, then being short-sighted has been associated with raised intracranial, intraocular pressure, conditions which increase um, venous uh, resistance. So, I mean, I don't know how you, what you mean by obtained, um, I don't know. Um, so if you're diabetic, you're diabetic. So I don't know what you mean by obtained. Um, if you have allergy and are using steroids for a long time, then you are at risk of raised pressure. If, you're, if you have a family history of, um, perhaps you need to open your mic and explain the question. I'm not sure I've understood. JK. What is the relationship between physiological cap disc and glaucoma? Well, there's no relationship. Um, some people have a very big disc. And because they have a very big disc, then they have a lot of space through which the neural tissue can, can, can be, they have a large room. So when you look at those, you find that they have um, what seems like a capped disc, but it's actually not. So one of the things you do is to compare the left eye with the right eye. If it is symmetrical, then most likely it is physiological because like I said, glaucoma tends to be asymmetrical. The other thing you can do, if you have an opportunity of examining their siblings, and you will see the same thing. So then the conclusion is physiological. But also you must do visual fields and OCT, rule out any um, issue. Because someone can have 
large caps when they also have glaucoma. Okay. Um, I was waiting for JK to, to, to explain. Uh, but yes, I mean, from research, you can, um, all, this, all this stuff is from research. By doing an analysis, you can see the factors which are predictors of glaucoma. And if you find the odds of glaucoma among diabetes, um, diabetics are more than people who don't have diabetes, then you can uh, link diabetes with glaucoma. All right, I propose that we take a two minutes break. You don't have to go off, but I will just mute myself for two minutes, uh, drink some water, and then um, off we go into cornea. Thank you.